For many people, myself included, Just Cause 2 was their first experience with the Just Cause series as a whole. This is no coincidence, as this game, unlike its predecessor, sold remarkably well, catapulting a semi-niche series into becoming a household franchise. In my opinion, this meteoric rise couldn't be attributed to one single thing this game did well. Instead, it was due to major improvements overall compared to the first game. Gone are the linear uninspired liberation missions. They have been rightfully replaced with the non-linear settlement system. The main missions, while far fewer, are now longer and better in almost every way imaginable. And of course, I can't forget about the sandbox that gets this very same treatment, with new and improved tools, as well as a fresh map to complement them. All of these, as well as many more changes, make for a truly enjoyable experience that you would only see glimpses of in the first game, making Just Cause 2 not just a great sequel, but what I would consider to be a perfect one. There's one word I would attribute to the way Just Cause 2 handles the many aspects of its simple yet unique gameplay, that one word being chaos. No, 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 no. Well, kinda, but the word I'm mainly looking for is non-linear. From the very start, Just Cause 2 sets the stage for how the rest of your game will be experienced. This is due to the first ever mission, which on the surface gives you a task as simple as collecting a few memory cards using your initial toolset. However, underneath the surface, the mission is a bit deeper than a quick tutorial. It's complex in the fact that it also serves to embody that non-linear philosophy that makes the game unique. Take for example the part of the mission where you're supposed to grapple onto the helicopter to progress forward. Most people would do this without question, subconsciously trying to avoid that dreaded mission failed screen. And while Just Cause 2 does have that screen, it's strictly reserved for those moments where you actually fail the mission. Because as far as Just Cause 2 is concerned, doing things your own way isn't failure, it's independence. It's why, when you choose not to follow the path that the game set for you, it doesn't hit you with a mission failed screen. Instead, it acknowledges your decision and trusts that you'll figure things out on your own. You always have to do it your way, huh? Well, get on with the mission then. There is no strict handholding. You're not tied to any one path, and there's no artificial limit to what you can do. You are given a task and a generous area in which to fulfill it. Any and everything else is up to you. Your creativity, your choices. You are the one who makes this game what it is. And never is this more apparent than when you're released into the vast playground of Pan Am. If you listened to me talk, or more appropriately rant about the first Just Cause, you'll know that what we had in that game was a truly abysmal excuse for a map. Sure, San Esperito was astonishingly vast, especially considering the hardware of the time, but that's about all the praise I would give it. In fact, I would go so far as to say that it was all the devs cared about. To hell with decent environmental or urban design, and honestly, who cares about interesting side content, or a map with personality. Size was the name of the game, because as long as they could boast that they had the biggest map in 3D gaming, that's what their first priority was. However, this time around there's new hardware, and with that means they no longer have to sacrifice gameplay over having a big map. Of course, this also meant that some games that didn't need to have a big map did, a trend that continues to this day but luckily that's not the case here. This time around, Just Cause actually earns the right to have a big map, because unlike the first game, it's actually full of content worth exploring. In fact, I'd argue that this map is so good, it's possibly the best part about the game itself. Okay, but before I talk about that, let's first just back up a little bit and see how this map has improved when compared to the first game. Obviously, there are the changes with environmental diversity that was noticeably lacking in San Esperito, 
Now there's a mountainous region, a desert, more unique islands, and distinct landmarks. The second most noticeable change is to the urban design that used to look like this, literally just grids of buildings and unnamed, unmarked cities, that has now evolved to look like this, which is far, far more believable than its earlier counterpart. By themselves, those two changes make this a good map enough to warrant some praise, but by no means would the map be game-changing, even for the series. No, to push it to that next level, it needed to be something other than just simply easy to look at. It needed to feel alive, be unique, full of that personality that was severely lacking in the first game. So how do you do that? How do you add something as abstract as personality to a map in a game like this? I struggled for far, far too long to answer this question myself, but after thinking about it for a long time, the answer was shockingly obvious. All you have to do is treat the map less like a map or a static landscape and more like its own individual character. This can be done in a large variety of ways depending on what type of open world the game is going for. For instance, the Mojave in Fallout New Vegas, while not particularly beautiful in the traditional sense, is considered to be one of the best open worlds simply due to the NPC interactions and unique quests that make it stand out and echo the tone of the game. Now obviously Just Cause is nothing like a Fallout game, and in fact Panow might be the furthest thing you could possibly get from a New Vegas style open world but even without any quests or nearly any NPC interactions, it still finds its own ways to feel unique and echo the tone of its own game. The most surprising of which comes from something that you wouldn't expect this world to have. A story. Not the traditional one of course, but more like the seeds of one. For some examples, let's first take a look at the ruins that are liberally sprinkled across the map. These not only complement the southeastern Asian vibe this game is going for, but also make Penau feel like it had existed long before you got there. Like the current civilization is simply the next step in the island's history, not the other way around. And okay, maybe you think that's a bit of a reach, that I'm the one thinking too far into it, not the devs. Well then what about the fields of deforested land that are at first simply noteworthy, not even attention grabbing, but become far more interesting when you realize that most of them lie on the right side of the map, which just so happens to be the most industrial part of the island. That's not a mistake, that is something that was deliberately put there by someone who genuinely cared about the world they were crafting. Then there's the fact that canonically, the islands were settled by the Spanish during the Age of Exploration, and because of that, the flag of modern Panau looks similar to Cuba's, another country with a similar backstory. Each of these are simple examples of basic world building, that in this case specifically are pretty effective. Yeah sure, they don't paint the whole picture of the history of Panau, but that's not their goal. It's simply supposed to make you feel like there is one. They give you just enough so you get a basic idea of Panau's story, then let your imagination fill the gaps. And look, I totally understand that these aren't what made the game sell as well as it did, nor are they necessary for most people's enjoyment. But for players like myself, this type of stuff is what makes me more appreciative of games like this. Because of course a story driven game is going to go out of its way to add world building to their map, but a game like this doing that same thing? is in a way more impressive because it wasn't necessary. It brings us back to the point I was making before, that this game could have stopped after making the map simply appealing, but instead they chose to go further. They added world building fit with interesting landmarks, some of which are fairly obvious, but others tread more on the second half of this character equation. The half that most people, myself included, would consider to be the main reason why this map is so iconic. Of course, I'm talking about the fun easter eggs that are now synonymous with the series as a whole. And no, I didn't forget about them in Just Cause 1, they just weren't there. It's this game that you can thank for starting the trend, where you can find such classics like The Bubble Gun, The Snowman, Sharkatron 3000, The Beached Whale, The I Am Legend Chair, Pie Island, Skull Island, All of Hantu Island, which is one big lost reference, and the best of them all, 
the fully functioning hot air balloon. None of these, apart from Hantu Island, are in any way pointed out to the player. They were initially intended to be found by those who were willing to explore or got lucky and stumbled upon them. For those players, it dramatically deepens their connection with the world, as it's now not just the marked areas that are of interest, it's anywhere. Anywhere could have an interesting easter egg. Of course, not anymore, they've all been found, but that actually brings us to my second point. That while players who find them will remember that moment forever, they will also share their experiences which creates a viral discussion about the game as players continue to share their findings to both their friends as well as the wider internet. This as far as I can tell is one of the core reasons why Just Cause 2 was so successful, because as we've seen time and time again, games that spark discussion in any way, but more importantly in a positive way, are far more likely to stand the test of time. Easter eggs were simply the perfect execution of that in this game, as they not only spark discussion, but also echo the tone of the game perfectly. What better way to show players the unserious yet surprisingly deep character of Pan Ao than to have numerous fun and lighthearted easter eggs hidden throughout the map. Everything I've mentioned so far was critical to improving the overall experience of this game's much improved open world, but like I've said before, that's only half of what these games are supposed to offer. As I've explained with Just Cause 1, there's a single word that defines what makes or breaks a sandbox game. That one word is freedom, and not just in where you can go, but also what you can do. When it comes to the former, not much has really changed between these installments. You're simply given a short mission or two that shows you the ropes, then you're given free reign to go wherever you'd like. It's really the latter where this game makes its major improvements, the first of which is the iconic grappling hook that I can proudly say finally lives up to its potential while still leaving room for improvement. In every sandbox game, there will always be four potential ways to use every single tool given to the player. You can use a tool for traversal, combat, resource collecting, and shenanigans, which is basically just creativity, whether that be with building or just having fun. In games where you're given a lot of tools, it's okay to have most of them only do one of these four things. But in games where you're given a very small number of tools, it becomes clear that most, if not all of them, have to serve two or more purposes. In the case of Just Cause, there is no resource collecting, so we can ignore that, but that still leaves three uses for each tool. If we talk more specifically about Just Cause 1 and its grapple gun, it was one of, if not the only, main tool in your immediate arsenal, and it was only able to do one of these three things traversal, and even that, it didn't do very well. This was something that Just Cause 2 set out to remedy, but to do that, the grapple didn't just need slight tweaks. No, it needed a complete overhaul, a reimagining of the entire process. The best way I can describe the change going from the grapple gun as seen in the first game to the wrist mounted grappling device in this one is that it's a night and day difference. For example, in the first game, there was this whole process of getting it out, then finding a vehicle to attach to, and hopefully at that point you could sun jump to it. This entire process is gone, with the simple change to put the device on Rico's wrist. Now there's no longer that extra annoying step of pulling it out. It's simply always active and accessible with the click of a single button. That alone is a pretty big change that makes gameplay far more fluid, but it doesn't change the fundamental problem. The fact that it's still missing two of those three essential elements, and even the third, is no longer up to par with the open world standards of the time. So how did they fix it? By reworking the grappling hook altogether from the ground up. Now it doesn't only work on vehicles, you can attach it to literally anything which not only opens up opportunities for combat as seen in the first mission, but also when it comes to traversal. Gameplay is no longer slowed down when you get stuck in a spot that's difficult to scale or too high to jump to. You now just grapple to any point, quickly closing the gap between you and your target giving the world a whole new dimension of verticality and freedom that was practically non-existent in the first game. 
but of course the best change is when the grappling hook is paired with the parachute to become a self-propelled paraglider. No longer will you get yourself in those situations where you're stranded in the middle of nowhere without a form of transportation. Simply attach to any solid surface and slingshot yourself in the air. Then deploy your parachute and use your grapple to pull you to wherever you need to go. This was the very thing that was missing from the first game. Of course, I'm not even sure if the PS2 was able to handle this type of traversal, but nonetheless, it was still what was missing. Traversal is one of those things that can absolutely make or break an open world game. In fact, even if you have a decent to bad open world, a lot of people will forgive that fact entirely simply because traversal is fun. Whereas if you have that same open world, but traversal is lackluster, people are unwilling to give you the same amount of slack. Now, that's not to say that open world games have to have fun traversal. Elden Ring doesn't, but it makes up for it because the world is actually interesting and rich with content. But we're getting off track, let's get back to my main point. That Just Cause was missing that fun, accessible, and smooth form of transportation. Its over-reliance on vehicles while having a mostly rural map made it so it was easy to get lost or stuck. That, in turn, resulted in building frustration that I have admitted tainted my experience with the game as a whole. Just Cause 2 on the surface is this exact same way. It has a mostly rural map, a lot of vehicles, and you will get stuck frequently. The main difference is that you now have that fun, accessible, and smooth form of short-range transportation, so all of those problems are no longer problems. They don't stop you from reaching your destination. They simply become an extra step that no longer taints your experience overall. All of that was how they improved upon traversal. There was a little bit of combat sprinkled in there in the beginning, but really where both combat as well as shenanigans were improved was when it came to the other utilities added to the grapple. For close combat, there's a new melee button that utilizes your grapple as a weapon in case you're out of ammo. However, if you're in that same situation and enemies are far away, your best bet is going to use the grappling hook's new detachable feature to pin them to a wall or another nearby enemy. This gives you a few seconds of time to either think of a new solution or run away. But in my opinion, this feature is mostly useful when it comes to getting up to shenanigans. The ability to attach one thing to another may seem pretty simple, and it is. But it also opens a whole new world of opportunity in a game like this. I can't tell you the amount of times I would attach a car to a plane as a kid and laugh hysterically as a car would swing around aimlessly. Then there's the fun you can have with the police as they chase you and you use your grapple as well as their speed to send them flying off the road. A bit of combat and shenanigans rolled into one. This is when Just Cause is at its best, when you can screw around in this huge world and at every corner all you can see are the opportunities. Which brings us back to the beginning of this section where I talked about freedom. Because isn't that what freedom truly is? At its core, it's opportunity. To go where you like and do what you please. But you can only do that if there's a larger system that allows it. You can't have freedom if you aren't given the opportunity to explore your options. In Just Cause, this larger freedom of opportunity is expressed within the chaos system as well as the non-linear settlements. Both of these have replaced the old faction system as well as the faction missions that, as you may recall, offered zero freedom. The missions had the exact same beginning, middle, and end, with you starting the liberation, destroying barricades, and replacing a flag or killing a leader. This obviously wouldn't work in a game all about non-linearity. Also, it was just completely unfun, so regardless, something needed to change. What they came up with is what I'm going to call the settlement system, which specifically refers to the open-ended settlement-specific gameplay within the larger chaos system which we'll talk about shortly. Okay, that's cool, I can hear you saying, but what is it? Well, it's that thing that you were already taught from the very first mission. It's what you were doing when you assumed you were getting distracted and blowing stuff up or collecting upgrades, but you weren't getting distracted. You were doing exactly what the game wanted you to do because blowing stuff up and collecting upgrades is the settlement system. And while that may seem simple from an outsider's perspective, it's that same simplicity that makes it work so seamlessly. 
because unlike the liberation missions, there is no clear starting, middle, or end point. The whole idea is that you can complete them however you would like to at your own pace. It's also why I said that there's no clear end, because you can choose where you want to draw the line. If you want to go and complete half a dozen or so settlements because you can't be bothered to stick around for long, that's totally okay. Or if you're a completionist like me and want to spend more than 50 hours to eventually complete every single one of them, that's just as valid. Actually, now that I think about it, in a weird way it's less valid, because the reason for the ungodly amount of content is not to drive up the time to get 100% like some games, it's so at every single corner you're given the opportunity to progress. It's why there are literally more weapon, vehicle, and health upgrades than can be used. The whole point is not that you have to collect all 2,250 of them, and yes there is that many, it's that there are so many that you will naturally get plenty of them, and you won't ever feel like you have to go out of your way and search for them. They will naturally always be laid out in front of you no matter what path you take. The same thing can be said about the settlements. There aren't over 360 of them because you're supposed to do them all, there's that many so you don't have to. Each of these many aspects, the settlements, the collectibles, every single explosion, they're all fairly satisfying and somewhat meaningful on their own. However, there's one thing that gives these aspects greater meaning. It's the backbone of progression, as well as the metaphorical bow that neatly ties the entire game together. That thing is the chaos system. The way the chaos system works is best described as simple yet elegant. Simple in the sense that it's not needlessly complicated, yet elegant in how it complements the greater sandbox. Here's how it works. Almost anything you do in this game, whether that be blowing up a police car, collecting a faction item, or decimating settlements, will earn you something called chaos. Chaos cannot be spent, traded, lost, nothing. It's basically just XP, a way to track your progress without you having to do anything specific. But that's not to say that it's useless, because it's actually required to progress through the main campaign, as well as the many faction missions, and to unlock new black market items. In this way, the chaos system, and therefore anything you choose to do, becomes the main game. This is the elegant part of the system, because no matter how you play, everything is feeding into this single, ultimate path of progression. If you choose to focus solely on missions because you like structure, you can earn chaos that way. Or, you could avoid missions almost completely and stick to the open world forever, never once completing a mission while still being able to do mostly everything. Like I said, simple yet elegant. And the reason it can stay that way is because while it is the main form of progression, it's not the only one. There's still other ways in which you can make progress that are a bit more specific, yet are still under the umbrella of the chaos system. Chief among these are the faction strongholds. These are initially unlocked by contacting each one of the three factions after unlocking the open world. These factions being the Reapers, Roaches, and Ular Boys. After making contact with any one of them, you'll be transported to a large military stronghold where you'll have to escort a technician from the entrance into the heart of the stronghold. Here you'll have to defend the technician as well as kill the base's commander to finish liberating the stronghold. This will reward you with chaos as well as root the faction's influence in that part of the map. This rewards you with a few missions that we'll talk about shortly, however to get more you'll have to cause more chaos which in turn unlocks more strongholds as well as expands the influence around existing strongholds. Now, it's important to note that this system is not dynamic. Like with the missions, everything with the factions is going to start and end the same for everyone. You don't get to choose where these factions set up base or how the map looks in the end, of course assuming you do everything. And while that may seem pretty linear, that's actually not the case. Because non-linearity is not about these overly complex dynamic systems where everything will be different for everyone. It can be that way, but it doesn't have to. It's totally okay to have a conclusive ending, as well as a set start. Because it's the path in which you get there, the middle, that's ultimately important for non-linearity. So that's how the faction stronghold system works, but what about the faction missions? What role do those play within the chaos system as well as the larger game? 
Well, the first question is fairly simple to answer. They give you upgrades and chaos, both useful for general gameplay. It's really the second question that I find is far more interesting. Near the end of talking about Just Cause, when I was covering the main campaign, I briefly mentioned a problem I had with some of that game's missions. More specifically, I said that a lot of them felt like filler, and should have been regulated to side missions while the main ones get more attention. This would ensure that the main missions stick to being these big action set piece spectacles while the lesser missions could add some much needed mission design to the open world. Well, it seems like Avalanche felt the same way because this game does exactly that. Just Cause 2 has 7 main missions, called agency missions, that also include the two you do before you unlock the open world. Each of these missions are big and noteworthy, making it so you actually care when you unlock one. None of them have filler, and each of them have their own unique mission design that make them stand out from the rest. Unfortunately, the side faction missions did not get this same level of care. They are far more abundant, and therefore, their level of quality varies from nearly main mission level to complete wastes of your time. In total, there are 49 faction missions, and we are going to talk about every single one of them. But hold on, before I lose you, because I know the 49 is a big number, to keep this interesting, and quite honestly me entertained, I'm not just going to list them off one by one. Instead, I'm going to throw them into a tier list. As usual, this list will go from S, which is the best, to A, B, C, D, then at the bottom is F. You know the drill, it's a regular tier list. So without wasting any more time, let's just jump right into it by picking a random one, Chemical Heist. All right, not bad. This mission has you going to a lab in the mountains to collect some samples, then return them in a short time window. Again, not bad. Not nearly main mission quality or length, but it's not a waste of time either right in the middle, solid C tier. Next we get Black Gold. This one is definitely stepped down from the last as all it has you doing is damaging an oil rig. I kinda like how it's open ended so you can get creative with how you beat it, but it really only feels as if it's the start of the mission, because by the end you're kind of left feeling like, that's it? Something that while looking at my notes was actually shockingly common, and for that it goes into the D tier. Speaking of that's it, smugglers do run. This mission is short, and by short, I mean you get in a boat and destroy another boat. That's it. It has you doing something in less than 30 seconds that you can do as many times as you want in the open world. It's a complete waste of your time, easiest F tier ever. So far, we have talked about missions that are either alright or worse than alright, but now let's finally talk about a good one. Mile High Club has you traveling to the Mile High Club, a yacht suspended hundreds of feet in the air by two massive airships. Once aboard the Mile High Club, you hack a few computers where you learn that there's a giant bomb in the airship itself that you have to detach before it self-destructs. Just by that simple explanation alone, you can already see why this mission stands out. From its setting to its conclusion, everything about it is pretty memorable. Well, everything except for the actual middle of the mission where you just hack a bunch of computers. So while the setting and the conclusion are really memorable and exceptional, I can't ignore that the meat of the mission is pretty boring. And for that, I can't really put it any higher than B tier. Above the law. This one is pretty simple. You defend a hacker. Wait, is that it? Okay, well, I looked it up and I thought I skipped something on my script, but I guess that's just the whole mission. Um... I, it looked like it was kind of long and like it, you can have some freedom in completing it. You can kind of get up to some shenanigans and mess around. So I'll give it D tier, but that's really just because there's a level of freedom that you can mess around with. But it's, these missions are so short. Some of them are tiny. Save the forest. Now this one is actually fairly good. It has you traveling to a lumber mill, destroying silos. Then there's a boss fight. Well, not a real boss fight, but you kill a boss in the form of the foreman. Now, this would be B tier if this boss was actually difficult to kill or had unique mechanics. But because he's not, he's just some dude in a truck, I think it sits comfortably in C tier. Be quick or be dead. You hack a computer, then the mission's over. Too short to be worth anyone's time. F tier. Keeping the flow. 
disarm four bombs in five minutes. It's pretty simple. It at least lasts a couple minutes. It's easy. I'll give it D tier. Oh, hold on. Here's another one called the red one or the blue one. And for some reason, it's the exact same mission. Four bombs in five minutes. Oh, well, I mean, there are 49 missions, so having one or two duplicates isn't a huge deal. I'll put it in the same spot as the other one, obviously, but let's just hope that's one of the last of our duplicate missions. Ups and downs. Now this one is a bit different. This mission has you going into a military base and destroying a fuel shaft by hacking into a computer. It's easy, not that interesting, and short, which would make it F tier, but I can't ignore the fact that it does serve another purpose. It's a tutorial for the dozen or so other fuel shafts that you'll encounter throughout the game. This is evident by the fact that this mission comes within the first group of missions you unlock with the Reapers. So the idea is that you're supposed to complete it early on. However, there's a pretty big problem with this, because in a game all about non-linearity, you can't expect players to do things in the order you want them to. Sure, it's easy to see how a player might do this mission early on and gain a lot of value from it, which was the intention, but it's also a possibility that a player could put dozens of hours under their belt and this be one of their last missions. At that point, they would have likely already figured out how to destroy the fuel shafts on their own and see this as a complete waste of time. And while some of you may be thinking about how unlikely that is to occur, that's not really my point and it doesn't really matter because no matter how unlikely a situation, if you're making a game that's supposed to be non-linear, this is one of those things you have to consider. Players aren't always going to play things in the order you laid out for them, so you have to find other seamless solutions to teach players things that they need to know without assuming that they will play the content in the order you want them to. But putting that aside, while I do think this mission is pretty short and lackluster, I do see the value that it brings to most players, so I think it barely makes its way into D tier. Alright, there's been quite a bit of negativity so far, so I think it's about time for another good one. Fry Me to the Moon begins with you going to the Panow Space Center where there are three satellites mounted atop three rockets. As soon as you destroy the first one, a countdown to launch begins where you are then on a timer to destroy the other two. As soon as you do, you are informed about a fourth and final rocket that is currently launching from a remote launch site. You then have to get in a jet and race to the location where you see a rocket launching and you have to destroy it before it gets too high. This mission not only has a good premise where the satellites are being used to further the government's agenda by spreading propaganda, but also it's decently long, leaves enough room for creativity, it's memorable, and it offers something that none of the other missions have so far, which is spectacle. And for that, this mission sits proudly in the A tier, the setup. Now this one is pretty simple. It has you stealing a jet and attacking a military base. And I gotta admit that like the last one, it does have some level of spectacle. The problem is that it doesn't have you doing anything that you won't do dozens of times in the regular open world. And it's not like stealing a jet is like something the players need to be taught. So I just don't really see the point of this mission. And for that, I think it gets F tier. Stop the press. Oh, um, that's weird. This one's just like Smugglers Do Run. I guess that adds to the number of duplicates as well as the missions that are in F tier. But you know, at least that's probably the last duplicate mission, right? Hell on Wheels. There's a Reaper convoy and you have to hop from car to car disarming three bombs in total. It's a decent idea, but again, it seems like step one of a larger mission. D tier. Helicopter hang around. Destroy three helicopters before they have time to travel to and destroy a silo. And not to sound like a broken record, but again, it's simple and feels like a step or finale to a larger mission, not the whole thing. I mean, let's look at another mission called Can I Get a Witness? This one has you travel to a radar facility, retrieve a keycard from an officer, download coordinates from a computer, grab onto a helicopter, hijack a vehicle, and then take the witness to a delivery point. It's insane to me that both of these missions give you the same reward, when one of them is almost a main mission and has multiple steps, and the other one is barely a mission at all. Helicopter hang around goes into D tier, and can I get a witness goes into B tier. Pirate broadcast. 
travel to the Pan Out Broadcast Center, hack four computers to align four satellites, and finally destroy the big one atop the building. Solid length, solid premise, solid all around. C tier. All right, how many of these have we talked about? 17. All right. Well, this video is going to be way too long unless I pick up the pace, so we're going to talk about one more good one, then it's going to be rapid fire until we get to the end of this section. But for now, we're going to talk about taking out the dishes. To further show just how good the good missions are compared to the bad missions, this mission has you traveling to a giant satellite dish to activate a terminal that gives you a short cutscene before you have to kill a boss. At least this game's version of a boss, kind of like the other one. Then you activate a second terminal and destroy a giant receiver. So while one mission has you literally killing a guy in a boat in less than 30 seconds, another one is this, a mission that is arguably just as good as some of the main missions. And the craziest part about me saying all of that is that it's not even the best one. A tier. As promised, it is now rapid fire time, so I will be going through the rest of the 30 or so missions as fast as physically possible. The broader scope, you snipe a guy, that's it. F tier. Fender bender, destroy a bunch of nice cars in three separate locations, at least it's satisfying. D tier. Mercenaries must die, go to a training camp to kill one guy, I don't even think I have to explain that it's F tier. Siphoning gas, download three files, at least it's not one. D tier. Shakedown, destroy three vans. Simple, you got options. D tier. Offensive action, destroy silos. You literally do this hundreds of times in the open world. This does not need to be a mission. They're insulting your intelligence. F tier. River runs red. Escort a boat traveling through a river, then destroy underwater mines. Actually not that bad. C tier. Death from above. Get into a helicopter, destroy jets. Kind of satisfying. D tier. Airport troubles, kill a dude for his PDA, hijack a plane, and the best part is that a funny glitch happened to me, so it goes into D tier. Clear skies, go to a base, hack one computer, why? F tier, an officer and a hitman, go to a mansion, destroy SAM sites, kill colonel. D tier, breaking and entering, go to a base, hack a laptop, F tier. These missions are such a waste of time. Information highway, hijack a car and drive it while you download information. F tier, one deadly sin, kill a dude in a car. F tier, why? Nothing to declare, hijack a helicopter. Yep, that's it, F tier. Rico's day in court, hey, that's an interesting name, maybe it's one of the good, no. F tier, it, you just kill a few guys, it doesn't fucking matter. Okay, these next two, actually I'll give them credit, they have something a bit more interesting about them. They are head of state and opane redentor. Both of these are about destroying a statue and delivering the head to a location, except one of them is via tank and the other is via helicopter. The reason these are more interesting is because they're fairly simple, but they at least try to teach you something interesting and like a creative aspect of the game. That you can use the heads of the statues as like a wrecking ball. I would have really liked to see more of these missions that teach you how to use things creatively, but I don't think that the tool set in the game is advanced enough for the game to have many missions where they teach you a bunch of different things. I really think that that's more of a thing that comes in Just Cause 3, but regardless, I think that the helicopter one is a bit better, so I'll give the tank one D tier, helicopter C tier. Okay, and that is nearly all of the missions. We still have about 12 left, but that's because they're all gonna be pretty quick to go over. And the reason for that is because they're all the exact same mission. Driving Miss Stacy, political debate, bridging new contacts, taming the beast, paparazzi pursuit, jumping parole, pulling a Jeremy, slipping and sliding, I want to break free, taking candy from a millionaire, and checking the menu are all delivery missions. A fifth, in fact, almost a fourth of all faction missions are delivery missions. Sure, some of them are slightly different from the rest, but that doesn't really matter because in fact, the ones that try to be different are actually the worst. In fact, I'd like to introduce a new tier below F specifically for a mission called checking the menu. This mission is one of my least favorite missions that can be in a video game ever. If you've played video games before, and I'm guessing you have, you can tell that it's one of those, hey, here's a truck full of empty fucking boxes, and they're tied down by hopes and dreams, and you gotta make it to your destination, but you can only lose a few of them, and don't worry about making it there safe, because even if you go slow, hitting the brakes at any point is like gambling with the physics engine. <laughs> can you tell I don't like that mission? I, I actually pissed me off, I hated playing it. 
But getting back on topic, all of these delivery missions are the exact same. You either steal a car, pick someone up and deliver them, or you're delivering the car itself. So just by hearing that, you can imagine that they aren't all that fun or that interesting and because there's so many of them that I would put it pretty low. But actually, all of these missions are going into the D tier for one main reason. I don't want to undercut how bad the F tier missions are by throwing all of these in there. So the F tier is going to stay the spot where all the actual bad waste of time missions are. And most of these delivery missions, while bad and while there are too many of them, don't fit into that category. So I'm not going to just throw it in there just because there's so many of them. Now, for those of you that have played Just Cause 2, you're definitely noticing that there is one mission missing. It's the golden child of the faction missions, the most famous of them all. This mission has it all. Story, spectacle, memorability, length, everything. There's a reason for its fame. It's not an exaggeration to say that it's genuinely better than some of the main missions. Stranded is the mission that takes the player to the infamous Hantu Island, or maybe it's better known as the Lost Island. If a player were to travel to this island before beating the Stranded mission, they would be met with a thick storm cloud before their boat or plane would mysteriously catch flame. No matter what form of transportation or angle of entry, it would always happen. This was the fate of an Ular boy's drug plane that attempted to use the clouds to hide transported contraband from the government. And since nobody who has ever been stranded on the island or has come back has ever been able to make contact with the mainland, the Ular boys are sending their very best to investigate. Nearing the island, communications cut as the dark clouds surround Rico. Directly in front of him, a smoke signal is spotted before a distractingly bright light shines from the island. Suddenly, the plane catches flame and Rico is forced to get to the smoke signal with only his grapple as well as the tools on his back. At the smoke signal, Rico meets with the pilot of the drug plane, who he then drives to the plane's crash site. On the way, the pilot explains that this island has had this looming storm for decades and the only explanation that people could come up with was that it was cursed. An explanation that supports why planes and ships would keep getting lost, never to be seen again. But in just the last few days that this pilot's been stranded on this island, he's discovered that it's not a curse at all. Everything strange about this island can be traced back to this nearly century year old large electromagnetic pulse array that has been causing the storm, destroying any unauthorized vehicles, and protecting the locals. These locals being hundreds of elderly Japanese men who are still under the impression that World War II has been raging on for the past 70 years. After dropping the pilot and truck off at the crash site, Rico is tasked with shutting down the EMP generator. He does so and afterwards meets back up with the pilot who has finished loading the truck with the supplies. Rico takes him as well as the truck to the beach where it seems like the storm is finally letting up. Rico drops off the truck, and the mission concludes. S tier. 49 missions, and yet only 5 of them manage to get into the top half of the tier list. Hell, let's even include the C tier, which only bumps that number to 10. That means that about 80% of these missions are either far too short, delivery missions, or they're genuinely unfun. Now don't get me wrong, these are still better than the old system in Just Cause 1, and my earlier point still stands that these helped give the open world mission structure as well as remove what could have been filler from the main campaign. However, if I were a person who liked doing these types of missions rather than exploring the open world, this would ruin the entire game for me. And before you say, well I've never heard of a person who plays the game like that, yeah, no shit. Nobody does because the vast majority of these missions suck ass. And I don't even have to tell you why. It's pretty obvious that they wanted that mission number as close to 50 as possible. But even if their original plan was to make each of them distinct and meaningful, I just don't think that would have been possible. In a game like Just Cause, there's really only a certain number of ways you can structure a mission, and even then I can tell you that that number is a lot lower than 50. In fact, I think that they would be pushing the upper limits of what's possible at a number as low as 20. 
but even taking that into consideration, that still doesn't mean that they're justified in doing what they did. Because I still think that if these missions were to be C tier at their absolute worst, then 25 solid missions would still be far better than what we have now. So that pretty much covers everything that can be found in the open world sandbox side of things. There were some things that I missed, like races and the black market, but I'll end up talking about those when I get to Just Cause 3. For now, there's still one thing left to talk about the main plot, as well as the missions that accompany it. The opening of Just Cause 2 sees the return of our action hero Rico Rodriguez traveling with Maria Kane to yet another exotic location, this time to Panau, a cluster of islands in Southeast Asia that is ruled by President Pandak Panay, or as the rebellious locals call him, Baby Panau. Kane tells Rico that the president has fallen out of favor with the US as well as the agency since he assassinated his father and took control of Panau. Afterwards, the agency sent in Rico's superior, Tom Sheldon, to figure out the president's agenda until Sheldon suddenly disappeared without a trace. Rico notes that Sheldon has done stuff like this before, but Kane mentions that this time it seems to be a bit different, and just to be sure, she needs to know that if Sheldon somehow turned, Rico would take him out. Rico hesitates to agree to the plan, but also agrees with Kane's assessment that he knows Sheldon the best and is most likely their only option if he has indeed gone rogue. The helicopter they are traveling in is then hit with some artillery which causes some important government memory cards to fall out. Afterwards, they come under heavy fire, causing the nameless man they are traveling with to get shot and fall out of the helicopter. This man just so happened to have Rico's PDA with him, meaning Rico has to jump after him. Now, before we get into the obligatory Just Cause Skydive opening sequence, I want to mention how just by that short opening cutscene, Just Cause 2's writing already makes a big leap in quality compared to the first game. I say that because in Just Cause 1, the writing as a whole was well, one-dimensional to say the least. Let's take Rico as an example. In Just Cause 1, he was basically just a stupider robot, whose simple job was to do what he was told and spout one-liners. Not once did he ever show any sort of emotion, hesitation, or intelligence in his dialogue. And look, I understand that these games are supposed to be kind of absurd and semi-satirical, I'm not arguing that they should be these serious, character-driven stories. In fact, in Just Cause 3, you'll hear me complain about just that. But for now, I'm just pointing out how already, just by simply hesitating when he's asked to do something, Rico's already established to be more of his own character who can feel emotions and somewhat think for himself. And while that does warrant some level of praise, I'm not going to sit here and say that the writing is now good. In fact, if Just Cause 1 had one-dimensional writing, the best you could say this game has is two-dimensional writing. Sure, there's an improvement, but there's still those moments where it's noticeably rough, which isn't helped by the hit or miss voice acting. Hey, where are you going? But overall, while I wouldn't consider the writing to be good by any means, especially when we get to the end, I do think that it is good enough. It does its one job of giving characters an extra level of dimension without making them needlessly complicated which just wouldn't fit with the tone of the game. After collecting his PDA, Rico is tasked with collecting the lost hard drives. However, as I've said before, this isn't the real mission. In reality, it's an introduction to the grapple mechanics, main gameplay loop, and nonlinear design that you can carry into the open world. After collecting the hard drives, Rico was picked up by Kane, who says their next step is to meet with an agency contact named Carl Blaine, who is being hunted as they speak. Upon arriving at Blaine's house, Rico and Kane are met by Jade, a contact of Blaine's who takes Rico to Blaine's real residence, a casino that Blaine spends most of his time at. Here, Rico encounters a large number of soldiers attempting to snuff out Blaine, but he arrives just in time to get him out of his situation. Blaine then agrees to help Rico find Sheldon, but only after he gets him back home. This is followed by a fun and memorable car chase sequence where you can really have fun with the grapple, then it's time for some exposition. Blaine fulfills his promise and explains to Rico that the current rumor is that Sheldon, codenamed the White Tiger, has started some sort of independent rebellion that seems to lack a clear goal. Sometimes they help the government, but other times they aren't so kind. He then explains that this group won't be easy to pin down, however by aiding the three other rebellious factions, Rico may be able to get some information. 
Once at his house, Blaine downloads some information on Rico's PDA, then sends him off to make contact with the factions under the alias Scorpion. He also hands Rico some beacons, which can be used to contact a black market dealer named Sloth Demon to aid his efforts. Afterwards, Rico meets with the three factions, each of which have their own complex philosophies. By that, I mean the Reapers are communist, the Roaches are capitalist, and the Ular boys are insane. However, Rico's goal is not to side with just one of these groups, at least not yet. He needs to gain each of their trust to get the information on Sheldon's whereabouts. Or at least, that's what the game tells you. In reality, as long as you're causing chaos, you're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. Eventually, after causing enough chaos, Rico is informed that a man named Ken Pang knows the location of the White Tiger. Rico heads to Pang's last known location, where he bribes a local man to give him information on Pang's whereabouts. This reveals that Pang is about to be executed in a nearby village, however Rico is able to stop it before it occurs. This is followed by a somewhat cinematic driving sequence that ends with Rico finding a dead drop left by Sheldon that reveals his actual location. Upon arriving at this location, Rico is hit by a mysterious dart that causes him to black out. He then wakes up face to face with Sheldon, who frees him from his restraints. Of course, Rico doesn't hesitate to punch him for all the trouble he's gone through to get to this point. However, Sheldon explains that he didn't completely leave Rico in the dark. He was helping him from the shadows as the mysterious Sloth Demon. Do you get it? Sloth Demon? Tom Sheldon? It's an anagram? I, I thought it was dumb too, but you know, maybe it's a joke. Please let it be a joke. Immediately following this reveal, they are attacked by the military, which they take care of, while Sheldon explains why he went into hiding. He says that when he arrived at Panau, he learned that Baby Pane was planning something big with some foreign governments. To not get caught, he had to go undercover, which made the agency think he went rogue, which is why Rico was here in the first place. So yeah, it's not really much of a big reveal, but to be fair, it's not really supposed to be. If that were the case, it would probably come later on, which is why I'm letting it off the hook. It's not some crazy reveal, it's just, you know, an explanation. After the military's cleared out, Sheldon says that his white tiger cover was only known by those he trusted, so somebody had to tip off baby Pane. Rico suspects Jade Tan, but Sheldon states that she's actually an agency spy as well. No, the real mole has to be Carl Blaine, who has been suspiciously quiet since Rico freed him. Rico then points out that Carl downloaded something on his PDA, which Sheldon concludes is how the military found them. After wiping Rico's PDA of trackers, Sheldon tells him that Baby Pane is planning something big with some international benefactors, and the only way to figure out what the plan is, is to continue to cause chaos and work with the factions. After some time, Rico meets back up with Sheldon and Kane, who inform him that, while she was doing research into who the mysterious international benefactors are, Jade Tan was captured by the military and taken to a base deep within the mountains. Seeing as though they would do whatever they could to get information out of her, Rico goes to rescue her. At the base, the plan is for Rico to destroy vent stations to flush everyone out. This works, however, instead of finding Jade Tan, Rico is met by MP5 wielding ninjas. After taking care of them, it's revealed that Jade was taken to the frozen river at the foot of the base, where they are attempting to make their escape. In addition to this, a submarine breaks out of the ice, and while Rico is attempting to save Jade, he must avoid the oncoming missiles shot from the sub. Eventually, Rico gets control of the vehicle carrying Jade, and they both escape by climbing onto Sheldon's helicopter. Plot-wise, this mission is nothing special, but gameplay-wise, this may be THE textbook Just Cause mission. I mean, it has everything you could wish for. A memorable location, exaggerated explosions, random shit like teleporting ninjas, or a submarine in the ice, in a lake, on top of a mountain, that are just never explained, and of course, a car chase sequence that doesn't overstay its welcome. And while I can admit that there are other missions in the series that may do some of these things better individually, for example, the second mission where you're doing another car chase where it's a little bit more fun, but no mission does everything better than this one right here. After everyone gets to safety, Jade presents what she found in her investigation. She says that each of the rebel factions have ties to a dangerous foreign backer, the Roaches to a Russian mobster, 
the Reapers to a Chinese sadist, and the Ular boys to a Japanese reject with a short fuse. Each of these factions are hard at work to take out baby Pane as soon as they can to put their marionette on the throne, however the reasons for this are unknown as it doesn't seem likely that it's simply for power. There has to be something else that's going on that they just don't know about yet. To figure it out, Riku continues to work with the factions and cause chaos until the truth is revealed. Eventually, Riku learns that the three international backers are all held up in a single location called the Three Kings Hotel. Riku relays this information to Sheldon, who assists with the infiltration. Upon their arrival, Riku comes into contact with each of the backers, who individually state that America and the agency are blind for not seeing the bigger picture, that Panau is more important than they could ever know. Of course, each of these encounters ends with Riku taking them out, causing Sheldon to state that the only way they will figure out the truth is if they get to baby Panay himself. To find his location, however, Rico must continue to work with the factions and cause more chaos. Okay. The next mission begins with Rico and Sheldon talking about their plan to get to Baby Pane. Sheldon states that Rico is going to have to side with one of the factions to get access to Pane's den, a secret fortress deep within the jungle. Rico questions what they're going to do after they get a hold of Baby Pane, to which Sheldon states that they'll do what the agency does best, and holds up his Regime Change in 7 Days book that was also present in the first game. Game. Afterwards, you're given the opportunity to choose which faction you would like to side with going into the final missions. Now, you could choose to side with the faction you genuinely think is best for the people of Panau, the ones that will bring justice and opportunity to a country that's been under tyrannical rule for years. Or you can make a much more mature decision, the one that really matters, and pick your favorite color. After siding with a faction, Rico escorts the troops through a canyon and into Baby Panay's fortress. There, he disables the artillery, giving the faction engineers access to panels that open the den. Once inside, Rico confronts Baby Panay, who anticlimactically reveals that the thing everyone's been after this whole time was as simple as oil. Granted, it is revealed to be the biggest oil reserve in the world, but it's still a bit lame. Suddenly, Carl Blaine comes out of literally nowhere and begins to blame Baby Panay for Jade's death. He then pulls out a grenade and takes him as well as Baby Panay out of the picture. Rico then states that Jade is alive and that she wanted to tell Carl that she'd never see him again. He then escapes, but not before setting the den to self-destruct. And okay, look, if you're confused, don't worry because it's obvious to me that none of that is supposed to make sense. You're not really supposed to think about it, which isn't a defense, nothing like that, but it's just obvious that this stuff is happening just because it needs to happen. I mean, I can imagine the conversation between the writers at Avalanche was similar to this. Hey guys, doesn't it seem like too much of a loose end to have Carl just completely disappear literally right after his first appearance? Yeah, I was thinking the same thing, but we don't really have an arc for him, so it doesn't really make sense for him to come back. Oh, unless we have him come back right at the end and maybe try to kill baby Pane. Yeah, but why would he do that? Hmm. Maybe we imply that he doesn't know about Jade's rescue, which would make him want to kill baby Pane. Yeah, but he can't kill baby Pane or we don't have a final boss fight, so what if we just have him die on his own? Yeah, but then Rico would just stay and kill baby Pane anyway. Ah, you're right. Well... I guess we'll just have to make it seem like both of them die in the exact same accident, except Baby Panay will magically survive both that and the self-destruct sequence, that way Carl comes back, then dies, Rico leaves, and we can still have that final boss fight. Now before I continue, I want to make something crystal clear. I'm not implying that the developers or writers are dumb or incompetent. They made a fantastic game and like 15 minutes ago I was complimenting them, so don't take that last part as me calling them stupid. Again, I just wanted to make that clear because when we go on to this next part, I don't want you taking that thought into it. There are many reasons why a story could have moments like this, where things sort of make sense but the execution is off. Most of the time, I'd say it has to do with the lack of time, which could be the case here, although I have a suspicion that the final decision to leave it be had more to do with this game's tone, not some deadline. And that's where my problem lies, because if this was indeed a deliberate decision, then I can't help but call it lazy. Because no matter the tone or audience of your story, bad writing is never the solution. The thought of, well, I'm just gonna write an action movie, so I'll just do whatever, or it's just for kids, they won't even realize it, 
will cross your mind, but it's your responsibility not to give it any validity. Because when you do, you risk having moments like this in your story. And again, to make something clear, I'm talking about making a story deliberately worse because it makes your job easier and you don't think the audience will care. I've had moments like this in stories I've written, but that's just because I didn't know what I was doing yet. A defense that the people who wrote this game, who I assume are professionals, can't use to shield their work. But again, if this was a time thing, then there's probably not much that could have been done, and all things considered, it's really not that big of a deal. With baby Panay out of the way, the situation becomes a bit more complicated. Now that oil is in the running, they know that every major country is going to be trying to get their slimy hands on the entire island. Rico's goal is to destroy the rest of the country's super tankers and secure the oil for the United States. However, Rico is given a new task once they observe a nuclear submarine surface in the ocean. After infiltrating it, Rico spots baby Panay, who is somehow alive and well. Rico eventually takes Pan A down, but not before he realizes he is in possession of four nuclear missiles. Each of these are aimed at a major country, these being China, Russia, Japan, and the US. With nowhere to escape, Pan A climbs aboard and launches the missiles. Rico chases after him, and while being shot at by Pan A, disarms three of the missiles mid-air. Finally, Rico gets to the one that is aimed at the US, the same one that Panay is on, and traps him aboard while he messes with the targeting system. Panay begs for his life, Rico has a one-liner, then he jumps off. This is when it's revealed that he changed the nuke's targeting system to the oil field so no country or faction could get their hands on it. Rico then parachutes down to Sheldon and Kane's location where he defends his decision to nuke the oil field. Sheldon and Kane state that the agency won't be happy, but that he probably made the best decision anyway. After all, destroying some oil to stop a world war is a pretty just cause. A just cause too. At its core, Just Cause 2 is a sprawling playground for chaos and creativity and its non-linear design is a testament to that. In a gaming landscape dominated by structured narratives, Just Cause 2 gave players the freedom to forge their own path however they saw fit. The open world, while roughly the same size as the previous game, is far, far more interesting. It succeeds in feeling like its own character that you can learn about and interact with while you explore. This is made possible by the overhauled sandbox, which not only added more tools to the player's experience, but also improved upon existing ones. All of these things, plus many more, are what made Just Cause 2 the household name it is today. And while it may not be perfect, in my opinion, it does succeed in being a perfect sequel, improving upon every aspect that made its predecessor unique, well deserving of all the success it has earned. We can only hope that what's to follow will not simply fill its shoes, but uphold a legacy.